Brady set Neil and me a challenge. He'd been shopping in a shop that sells bath bombs. These are objects, mixtures of chemicals and perfumes that people throw into their baths, much bubbling, and they smell nice. Have you ever used one? No, I haven't used one. I have baths, but I have more sense than to use bath bombs. Do you have more baths or showers? More baths. I'm like Archimedes. I have sometimes very good ideas in the bath. In fact, I was thinking about your challenge in the bath last night. Brady was in the shop and he saw some bath bombs called the Mad Professor. Now, why he was interested in the Mad Professor, I cannot guess, but you might. He sent me a challenge and Neil to do something chemically interesting with his bath bombs. There was a list of the ingredients some of which looked chemically a bit strange, but the main ingredients were sodium bicarbonate and citric acid. Citric acid is the acid that you find in lemons, oranges. It's an organic acid. Sodium bicarbonate is a very weak alkali. So the idea is that acid will react with alkali, liberate carbon dioxide, blow bubbles and give you a sort of bubble bath. So when you put it in a normal bath, Professor, it's not the bicarbonate reacting with the water. Is the water helping the bicarbonate react with the acid? Yes. First of all, we just put one of the poor professors into water, or rather we put him in an empty beaker and poured water over him. And just to make things a bit more complicated, the manufacturers had put some different coloured dyes in different chunks of the bomb. So the professor had blue streaks and green streaks and a red streak, which came out at various times. But chemically, we think that these dyes are completely inert. Brady, as you know, has a thermal camera which measures the temperature of whatever it's looking at. So I suggested he should point the thermal camera at the professor because Neil and I predicted that when the acid and alkali reacted, the professor would get hot. So-called exothermic reaction, meaning heat is given out. My reason was chemical. Neil's reason was most reactions are exothermic. On the other hand, Brady said he thought the temperature would drop, so-called endothermic reaction, and he has privileged information because he uses bath bombs and he's noticed they get a bit cold when he uses them in his bath. As it turned out, unfortunately, Brady was right. The reason probably is that the dissolving of the salts is the endothermic process and citric acid is a pretty weak acid. So the acid alkali reaction doesn't produce much heat, but heat is needed to dissolve the salt. And the professor is quite tubby, so there's a lot to dissolve. Hit that face. So then I thought that because sodium bicarbonate is slightly alkaline, that perhaps if we put an indicator, so-called phenolphthalene, which is colourless in acid and red in alkali, if we poured some colourless solution of phenolphthalene over the professor, a new fresh sample, it would go red because the professor would be slightly alkaline. 
nothing happened. The professor wasn't out the line. But Neil had a really historic sample of so-called universal indicator, which changes different colours for acid and alkaline. And this showed that the professor, when you pour the universal indicator over him, is slightly acid. It's acidic. That's an old, old jar, that one. This probably reflects on the fact that citric acid has three acid groups, and therefore even when it's neutralized, it still has some acid groups that have not reacted with the bicarbonate. So I was beginning to feel a bit cheated. There was Brady who was right once, Neil was right once, and I was completely wrong. I then had the idea that we should try shining UV light onto the bath bomb, the poor professor, to see if there was any fluorescence. Fluorescence is when a molecule takes in UV light and gives out visible light. Oh, yeah. Well done, I, Prof. And much to my pleasure, of the three dyes, the red, the green, and the blue, the green dye fluoresced very strongly. It looked a completely different colour, but it was emitting this sort of bluish light. Then we decided to be a bit more chemically vicious. We tried using concentrated sulfuric acid. Concentrated sulfuric acid has the property of removing the elements of water from compounds. And both citric acid and the so-called rice powder or rice starch that was being used as one of the ingredients in the bomb contain the elements of water. And if you extract those, you form carbon. And carbon is black. So having had a whole series of boring experiments where nothing much changed, we poured on the sulfuric acid and we noticed two quite different effects. The first effect was looking through the thermal camera and this time with the conch sulfuric acid the professor really lit up. There was a lot of heat. Partly this may have been the water being extracted and reacting with sulfuric acid because sulfuric acid releases a lot of heat when it's mixed with water. And secondly, it may be because the reaction of sulfuric acid with the ingredients of the bath bomb were inherently exothermic. But either way, the professor lit up. Secondly, and quite surprisingly, there wasn't much colour change. I'd expected the professor to go coal black straight away, and there was perhaps some slight discolouring, but that could have come from traces of the dye as it dissolved out of the bomb. But it did fizz in a really quite satisfying way. Mm -hmm. 
And then when the eel doused it all in the sink, the heat from the water going into the sulfuric acid caused really quite a lot of bubbling and a big temperature rise. Then, as you know, Neil loves burning things. So we decided to burn the poor professor. Neil had a gas torch and he also had a tube with a supply of oxygen coming out of essentially a needle which he could point at things. So when he played the flame on the face of the poor professor, the face went black, presumably because things were decomposing to carbon. So that's a good change. It's gone black. He then thought he would jazz it up by blowing oxygen on it and it should get much hotter. Oxygen makes combustion go faster. But really surprisingly, the jet of oxygen cooled things down. You could see on the thermal imaging camera it got cooler and visibly the flames got less. This doesn't mean that you should use oxygen as a fire extinguisher, but it means the blast of gas was enough to cool things down and Presumably, the oxygen diffused away so fast that it didn't really add to the combustion. So Neil got a bigger and better burner. And then when he put the big flame on the poor professor, when he added the oxygen, it really started burning. By the end, the poor professor had sort of become a black and white owl. I thought it looked rather elegant and artistic. Professor, were you worried about how much Neil seemed to enjoy setting fire to a professor? Well, I was concentrating so much on the experiment that I didn't notice the smirk on Neil's face. Otherwise, I might have got a bit worried. Anyway, we then thought... It would be interesting to see what happened if we poured some water on this owl. Unfortunately, part of the owl's face fell off before we got the water there. But what I thought was really interesting is that when we added water, the charred bits of the figure fell off and inside it was still completely white and had been largely unaffected by the heat, which demonstrates that these materials are very poor conductors of heat and also the material is sufficiently dense that the oxygen cannot really reach the middle so they can't burn. So after just a few minutes, it looked just the same as the unburnt professor. Do you think the bombs have to be dense like that so that they last a long time in the bath and the water can't get in as easily as well? I think that's almost certainly the reason. And also, you'd be very disappointed if your expensive bath toy, and I assume it was expensive, falls to bits as soon as you put it in the bath. So it has to have a certain strength, like a real professor, and doesn't fall to bits immediately. <laughs> 